put on this computer. Okay, so welcome everyone to the uh, latest installment in the uh, OFI Spring Winter 2023 lecture series. Um, tonight we have uh, Professor Benjamin Mako Hill as our guest. You may be uh, familiar with some of his work already or his talks uh, from the uh, Media Wiki, uh, we're sorry, Media, Wikimedia Association uh, or uh, Free Software Foundation. Uh, he is a, uh, an associate professor at the University of Washington Department of Communication and also an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Human Centered Design and Engineering, the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering, and the Information School. He's a member of Community Data Science Collective, which he founded along with Aaron Shaw. And at the University of Washington, he's also an affiliate faculty in the Center for Statistics and the Social Sciences, eScience Institute, and the Design Use Build Group that supports research on human computer interaction. He's also a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University and an affiliate at the Institute for Quantitative Social Science at Harvard. And today he's going to be uh, speaking to us about information quality in Wikipedia, but uh, I'll let him get to that. We're very excited to uh, welcome him and uh, hear what he has to say. There will be a discussion period after the lecture. So without further ado, Benjamin Mako Hill. Thank you. All right, so I'm pressing the share screen button and you can see that? Yes, we can. All right, sounds great. So um, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, uh, I think that um, uh, it's, it's wonderful. And it's, I think it's a, a, a person who is sort of a, you know, primarily a social scientist, but fundamentally sort of a consumer of machine learning and sort of AI. It's, um, it's an honor to be invited to uh, to to this um, to this talk series and honestly a little humbling. I recognize a number of the names of people that are here. I've learned a lot from folks that are here, and I hope that I can pay it back a little bit today. Um, uh, and with that, I will get into it. So um, you guys all know Wikipedia, and you all know or will not be surprised to hear that it's you know among the very most popular websites in the world, uh, sort of top five or ten. Um, and uh, you likely don't need me to tell you that it is the encyclopedia that anybody can edit. Uh, and you, of course, know this because it is displayed prominently on its front page, after all. Um, and even if you don't know, uh, you will not be surprised to hear that this arrangement, uh, the whole sort of editable by anyone arrangement, has led to some predictable problems that stem from the fact that many people have gone ahead and taken uh, the Wikipedia project up on its offer. So for example, um, for a brief period in October, 2017, the entire text, this, uh, what you're looking at right now on the slide was the entire text of the article on Batman, very popular article. Um, lots of people wanna learn about Batman. And if they happen to visit it during the, this brief period of time in October, 2017, they saw Batman, which is the, I don't know, it's an attempt to render into text the theme song for the 1960s show Batman um, uh, in a pretty high fidelity way, in my opinion. Um, uh, perhaps the most important or famous time, at least, that someone sort of took Wikipedia up, up on its offer uh, in a problematic way was when in 2005, when someone edited and actually created the article on John Siegenthaler. Um, Siegenthaler uh, um, is uh, a journalist, um, or was a journalist, he died recently, and a sort of relatively minor politician who happened to be the first editorial director for USA Today, which is um, one of the US newspapers with the largest circulation. And his biography page was sort of created by a sort of a, uh, and vandalized uh, to suggest that he'd been involved in the assassination of both John F. Kennedy and his brother, uh, Bobby Kennedy, um, totally untrue. Um, he was never implicated in the assassinations. Uh, I mean, he had nothing to do with it. 
Um, uh, this vandalism stuck around for about five months before Ziegy Dollar himself found it um, while Googling himself, presumably, like many of us ha have, have done, um, and contacted Wikipedia's founder, um, uh, Jimmy Wales. Uh, Ziegy Dollar also wrote, uh, who undid the work, Ziegy Dollar also, in addition to asking to get this fixed, wrote a scathing op-ed in USA Today, which he was very well positioned to do because he was, of course, the editorial director or had previously been the editorial director saying, you know, describing it as a personal story of internet character assassination. It could be your story. Um, this, these contributions to the Secret Dollar biography that it suggests that he'd been a murderer uh, were live, um, of course, um, uh, but they also reflected a major crisis for Wikipedia that is still sort of referred to as the Secret Dollar incident, um, and the Wikipedians who are here uh, will know it, I'm sure. Um, uh, but both of these were, I don't know, bad faith. They weren't honest attempts to improve the articles. They were people that are trying to get a laugh and succeeding, and I suppose, since, I guess, succeeding beyond their wildest dreams, given that I'm still talking about it and sharing it with you. The good faith contributions can also cause damage. So, for example, this is the this was briefly the text of the article on Harlem Shake, which is a dance. You could look it up in a Wikipedia article, and if you happened to look it up at the wrong time, you would have found that the entire text of the article was replaced with "Oh God, I didn't mean to delete it all. Just one paragraph, please help." Um, this person wanted to help. Um, uh, they wanted to improve the article, presumably by deleting a paragraph. I'm not sure which paragraph they wanted to delete, but one that they thought the article would be better without. Um, uh, uh, maybe they were going to replace it with something else, and, 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 and they didn't, because if you've pressed the edit button on Wikipedia, you know that it can be a little intimidating. Not everybody knows what to do. There are technical skills that are not equally distributed throughout society. And then there are lots of uh, skills related to how to make a good contribution to Wikipedia that might not, if you don't have them, you might not make this particular edit, but you might try to improve the article or maybe even improve the article, but in ways that sort of decrease the article in other ways, uh, the, the quality of the article in other ways as well. These are all examples of what people often refer to as vandalism, but which is probably better just called damaging contributions, stuff that requires cleaning up. This is the logo for administrators on, um, on Wikipedia. Um, it's got a mop because a big part of what that's a big part of what folks administrators, but actually folks who are sort of Wikipedians, and I count myself as one of these people. It's a big part of what we do. Um, they're what Charlton Gillespie refers. He refers to content moderators as custodians of the internet, and I think he's taking it quite literally, or at least in terms of the iconography, right? Um, uh, and there is plenty of stuff to clean up. This graph shows an estimate of the number of damaging edits made per day to English Wikipedia. Um, this was put together by Kaylee Champion, who's a brilliant PhD student in my group, and you'll, you'll hear much more about her and some of her other work um, soon. Um, uh, but but and, and I'll, you'll also hear about how I created this estimate of the number of damage, or she, how she created the number estimate of the number of uh, damaging edits per day. Um, but I want you to take away a couple things here. One is, is that damaging contributions are incredibly common. There are thousands of them made every day to English Wikipedia and many, many more to uh, the Wikipedia and the other you know, 300 or so languages in which Wikipedia editions exist. Um, uh, they range, depending on how we count, uh, between 25% of all edits um, uh, and maybe like 3 to 4% of the edits, depending on the day, of course, and how you count. Um, uh, and so there's a lot of these things. That's the first thing I want you to take away. The second thing that I want you to take away is that uh, is is kind of good news, which is that the uh, the estimated number of bad things is going down and has since about March two thousand seven um, on English Wikipedia, and that's of course good news because less damaging stuff seems good. Um, but the reason why, and we'll get to it, um, uh, is a little worrisome. Um, before we do, I want to provide one more example because it illustrates sort of the, the 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 whole process around balance that I'm sort of using to frame this talk. This is the article, this is a, a snapshot of the article on Jeremy Renner. Um, uh, I assume that some of the folks watching at home know who Jeremy Renner is. If you don't, well, his Wikipedia biography is up here on the slide, so you can just read it. Um, many of you probably know that Jeremy Renner is an American actor. Um, maybe you didn't know. I didn't know that he was also a singer-songwriter. And you almost certainly didn't know that he's a velociraptor. Um, because this, of course, is a piece of vandalism which was added to the article. Um, and it's not just a one-off thing. Um, this is kind of like a running joke. It's been going on now for like 10 years. People editing the Jeremy Renner articles, or really any article on Wikipedia that mentions Jeremy Renner, to insert things that imply or just say that he is a velociraptor. It stems from uh, 
like a sort of a community within Reddit that thought it would be funny to do this. Um, this is the list of articles, just over a couple, a list of edits. This is a, a, a list of uh, the history page. This is a list of all the edits made to the Jeremy Redder art article over a couple days in January 2013. Um, and I've highlighted a bunch of edit summaries. These are times when people typed in what they did. And you can see that basically there's a whole series of edits which are you know, stomping the velociraptor silliness or similar things in different words. Um, uh, this was happening over and over again um, in ways that are very creative and funny. Um, but I want to point out a couple other things. One is the source of all of this all of this velociraptor silliness. Um, so in Wikipedia, um, Wikipedia allows, when they say anyone can edit, they mean anyone, including people without accounts. Uh, they mean anyone without creating an account you can just press the edit button and make a change. And what you see here is that I've highlighted the, 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 the users who have made all this velociraptor edits during this period of time. And what you can see is that it's all these numbers. And these numbers uh, are IP addresses because when a person makes an, an edit to Wikipedia without creating an account, that edit is attributed to, it can't be attributed to their username because they don't have one. It's attributed to their IP address. These are all, uh, and, and this velociraptor vandalism is coming exclusively from new and unregistered editors, which gets to the next thing that I want to show which is that uh, towards the end of this period on January 30th, 2013, the page on Jeremy Renner, Renner the biography was, um, was uh, protected. I'm protected is almost euphemistic here. Uh, it, was, uh, what, it, was, it was changed so that new and unregistered users for an indefinite period of time could not edit the article. It was locked down. Now, in a sense, the Siegethaler incident had like a, uh, it was a much, bigger deal um, and it resulted in a much, but it resulted in, this, the end of the story is very similar. Um, uh, as a result of the Siegenthaler incident, uh, Wikipedia, the whole of English Wikipedia was locked down so that users without accounts could not create new articles. And actually that's still a restriction that exists to this day, um, including a whole bunch of additional restrictions related to um, uh, other biographies of living people. In response to real attack, Wikipedia became sort of closed, it became less open. Um, it became more difficult for users, especially users that were sort of starting out, those without accounts to contribute. And this is sort of bad for two reasons. Um, it led to real collateral damage um, of two kinds. The first was that, uh, that unregistered users who were just trying to help no longer could, and they were involved. This edit right here, which removed uh, the Velociraptor uh, um, from description of talents, apparently made it into his talents as well, was actually a change that was made. The, the, the work to repair that damage had been done by a user without an account. Someone who came along and was like, dude, no way, this guy's a Velociraptor. Um, and they couldn't do that after the article was protected. Um, uh, it also means, it's also bad because tomorrow's power users are today's sort of unregistered folks, right? The, um, some, of the, some, of that, uh, some of those sort of good faith edits are coming from people that are the Harlem Shake type editors who just haven't quite learned how to do it. And they're never gonna have an opportunity to because they literally will not see an edit button on this page. It'll say view source, they will not be able to edit it. Now, this basic dynamic has been documented by a range of people, first by um, sort of Aaron Hafecker, Stu Geiger, uh, Jonathan Morgan, and John Riedel in a paper in 2013, and then more recently by a bunch of work that folks in my group have done, including this paper led by Nate de Blentheis and also contributed to by Aaron Shaw. Um, Wikipedia and in our work, uh, we've shown um, many of the large peer production communities has become increasingly hard to contribute to over time. It built an immune system that has stopped or uh, that, 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 that has effectively stopped or, uh, um, uh, some of that bad stuff, but at the cost of preventing some of the good stuff. And that has led to increased rejection of newcomers, which has also led to decreased, uh, um, uh, decreased retention of newcomers. And this has led ultimately to the second problem, um, uh, this is uh, active editors on English Wikipedia, um, uh, where active is defined as, I think, making five edits a month. Um, and what you can see is that it peaked around 2007. Um, uh, and that sort of graph that I showed you, which showed damage peaking around March 2007 and then sort of decreasing and plateauing afterwards, um, uh, is paralleled by a very similar and contemporaneous decrease in the amount of good stuff coming in as well. These are, again, active editors to English Wikipedia. And we've seen similar dynamics. This is, again, from that paper that I just showed you by Nate de Blunt Heist that um, the Nate de Blunt Heist led in my group that showed that um, 
We see similar dynamics, but with peaks in different places among the largest wikis. That includes most, um, uh, not all, but the large majority of the largest Wikipedias, um, and also uh, hundreds of other wikis. This is from 700 of the largest wikis from uh, Wikia or fandom.com. They sort of rebranded. And it suggests a pretty similar dynamic among the largest wikis more broadly. Over a period of about four to five years, communities tend to grow, plateau, and decline. This is sort of standardized activity. Um, and that standardization sort of, um, uh, and like, well, both along the x and the y axis sort of like suggests uh suggests that this is large that this is at least some portion of this is an endogenous process this isn't a story about march 2007 wikis are peaking at different periods of time even different wikipedias are peaking at different period of time and it doesn't seem to be that this is a story of english wikipedia just like having written all the articles um unless you want to argue which polish wikipedia which has a very very similar sort of activity curve is going to be done uh, at a tiny fraction of the, the articles or that other Wikipedias with far fewer articles, all of which have fewer than English, uh, would be done earlier. Um, the problem uh, uh, it, it seems to be that this is, as I suggested, at least partially endogenous, that part of this decline is being driven not by the spigot of newcomers being turned off. The problem is not that people don't want to edit a Wikipedia anymore. People are still want to, and they're still showing up. They're just getting rejected, including good faith folks at increasing uh, at increasingly high rates. Um, uh, it's a vicious cycle. In order to provide the bad stuff, the community come, the communities become more difficult to contribute to. And as a result, there are fewer people coming in the door, which means someone has to man the mop, right? Because the bad stuff's still happening, at least some of it. Um, and then the pool of people who are able to do that goes down as well. And, and, and AI has been sort of turned to machine learning systems, this is like getting to the topic of the talk, has been, has been turned to as an answer to this, right? And it's been implicated in the problem. Because there are fewer people to do the work, we build, you know, we, we train machine learning systems to try to like identify bad stuff. And I'll talk about those systems. Um, and those increase the efficiency of the people who are there. But it leads to increased rates of newcomer rejection because the systems are not as good as the people. Um, and because being rejected by a bot is a bit of a bummer. Um, and particularly bad for one's longevity. And I'll talk about that in a second. But I want to spend sort of like the rest of the talk talking about how I think machine learning might be able to help, um, both because I'm, you know, I'm speaking in an AI institute and because I'm optimistic by nature. Um, um, and I'm going to argue that it can, and that it can in two ways, by putting new tools in the hands of, uh, of contributors, um, uh, um, of the contributors, um, and by uh, and by putting new, new tools in the hands of researchers who are trying to inform the policy decisions made by these communities. Um, I've been a little bit, I've been involved in a little bit of both, but a little bit more of the second, and I'm going to walk through some, how some of that happens. Um, I'm, I'm going to do three things in the sort of remainder of my talk. Um, uh, sort of about, uh, um, uh, I'm going to briefly describe uh, a machine learning system which has been built and run by the Wikimedia Foundation called ORS. Um, I didn't build it, but I'll tell you lots about it. Um, uh, and then I'm going to present uh, three sets of studies that I've used that have been studying and using, um, in some cases both, data from that system. I'm going to present a study that shows how Wikipedia um, uh, is using, and a bunch of different language Wikipedia editions are using machine learning systems to combat vandalism in ways that are leading to better outcomes for new and unregistered users. So that's a very optimistic um, uh, study. And then I'm going to present two studies that, have, that, that, that my group has done, which have used machine learning to present evidence about the value of these unregistered users in ways that can help shape and drive sort of policy, lowercase p, policymaking by, the, by systems like Wikipedia. Before I do any of that, I want to quickly acknowledge my own limitations and give credit to some others who really, you know, made this talk possible and contributed a lot here. First of all, um, my research group has not been involved in building any of the systems that I'll be talking about today. I, um, um, I'm, as I've suggested, a consumer of these ML systems, not a producer. Aaron Hafiger is the person who conceptualized and designed the system called ORS that I'll be talking about. Um, he's also, um, uh, he's not the only person who's worked on it in any stretch, and he's actually not even at Wikimedia Foundation anymore. He's at Microsoft Research working on different projects, but he's the person who started it and much of what I'll tell you today comes from things I've learned from his my conversations with him and from his papers. Um, and then I also want to thank, well, actually, all four of these people who are co-authors on the work that I've done today, and in the latter three cases are uh, the, the, the graduate students who led the research projects, Nate Sablantais, uh, Chow Tran, and Kaylee Champion. You'll see them all later. Um, uh, um, I'm presenting work that, that they were really the, the, the drivers on and sort of intellectual leaders on, so I want to give um, credit for them as well. All right.
So chapter uh, chapter two, um, uh, I want to briefly introduce ORS. I'm going to do this quick, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it later. So um, uh, ORS is a is a web service, and it's an and it's a, an API, a sort of an application programming interface that provides machine learning as a service, is the term, and it does it for Wikimedia projects. Um, it actually originally stood for the Objective Revision Evaluation Service, although I've I'm told by the documentation that the name is officially deprecated, presumably because it's not objective in ways that I will show you, uh, no longer uh, restricted to revisions, and not only um, uh, restricted to evaluations, perhaps like still a service, but I think that um, uh, uh, it's sort of grown and shaped in different ways. Um, this is a figure from the or the ORS paper, which was published, um, I guess, two years ago, a year, um, by Aaron Hoffinger and Stu Geiger, um, and it's really, it's a great paper, you should look at it for more details on ORS and how it works. Um, I'm going to give you a very cursory overview today, um, but there are some implementation details. I'm going to ignore a lot of the implementation details here, but there are three things that I want you to sort of notice here. The first is, is that ORS is not, um, this is the purple box, it's not a single model. Um, it's, a, it's a framework for fitting a whole bunch of models, there are actually hundreds of models, which um, uh, have been built on ORS, and I'm going to introduce you to well, I mean, we're going to use a couple dozen. Um, a couple dozen will be used in the stuff that I presented today, but they exist within a couple of families. The second thing I want to point out is that it relies on human model builders and a range of different kinds of data in order to uh, train those models. Um, so that includes um, a lot of live data, which is taken from uh, from from MediaWiki and the stuff that's happening in the wikis, but also a set of training data that comes from separate applications or from sort of hand annotation in various ways or from uh, um, a range of other places. Um, those are sort of integrated together. Um, and then the third thing, which is actually very critical, is that ORS doesn't actually have a user interface. Um, it's, not, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an API that can be used in a range of other tools, and I'll talk about what those tools are. There's a few examples up here. Um, I guess one of the potential users are researchers, and I'll, I'll, I'll walk through that um, moving forward. Um, or supports a lot, as I suggested, many hundreds of models, but they kind of fall into one of three groups. Um, I'm going to talk today really only about the first two. Um, uh, the, 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 the first set of models are related to um, models of edit quality. These are things that will look at a specific change to an article and tell us something about it. Um, the simplest models will tell us whether or not it will be reverted, um, uh, and then you can just use history of the data and a set of features mostly related to bad words to create reasonable models of whether or not things will be reverted. Um, a second set of models which rely on sort of um, labeled data um, uh, um, will, uh, are focused on identifying whether particular changes were damaging, did they make the article worse, um, uh, or were they were made in good faith. Um, so you can imagine something which is damaging, but not in good faith, like that, like that Harlem Shake, uh, like the edit that, that blanked that Harlem, Harlem Shake article. Um, there are also a set of models related to article quality. These are models that help assess the state of development of an article at a given point of time. Um, I've used both of these things in my own research quite a bit, and I'll show you a couple examples of that. There's also a set of um, uh, uh, models related to topic routing. These are things which are placing uh, placing uh, articles, like a Wikipedia article, within some sort of like taxonomy to help with classification or to point interesting edit editors towards that. I'm not going to talk any more about that today, but it is an interesting set of things that um, that ORS does. Um, these edit quality, these, are, these models are used in a lot of places. So for example, the edit quality, quality models are used by bots. So for example, um, uh, bots are generally speaking run by users. So other Wikipedians can use this service to identify articles that they, so to identify changes, edits that they believe are likely damaging and to automatically undo them before anyone sees them. So for example, um, that, uh, that article by, that edit by the, the, um, the, the system, uh, the, 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 the Batman thing was undone within a minute by, uh, not by orders, but by a bot using a, a quality, an edit quality model. Um, it can also be integrated into tools. So um, uh, there's a lot of people that are like, you know, you, you see these people are like, they've edited Wikipedia like millions of times. <laughs> the trick is um, uh, they're kind of RoboCops um, in many cases, uh, at least many of them. Uh, the, 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 there's um, a lot of Wikipedians um, uh, use tools to help with the editing process. And those tools do things like, you can see an example of one called Huggle right here, which uses ORS as a backend. And then what it does is it will show you a difference and it has buttons to undo the edit or to warn the particular user who made the change and to, to provide additional context, these sorts of things. Um, these, uh, these tools will um, uh, highlight particular kinds of edits based on, or can uh, highlight particular edits based on the fact that they are likely damaging based on the ORS model, for example. Um, uh, it can also be exposed in the interfaces of the wiki themselves, so people can see things that are flagged. And so if you've sort of heard about algorithmic flagging, this is an example of that. And I'm going to talk a lot more about that, but I won't say more now. And then, of course, it can be used by researchers, and I will definitely show you some examples of that. 
Quality models are different. Um, they tell you what the state of an, remember the state of, 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 a, of quality of an article is at a given, given period of time. Um, uh, and they can be used for a range of things as well. Um, uh, articles quality is assessed manually, at least on many, many wikis, um, many different versions of Wikipedia, language editions of Wikipedia. Um, uh, and having the system give you a good guess as to how that would work can be really useful. They can also be really useful for evaluating evaluating certain kinds of editing campaigns. So um, this is from the Wikiad dashboard, Sage Ross built this pretty cool little interface which um, shows percentage completion, which is using the ORS quality model on the back end. And this is actually, um, this is a, the purple thing is the set of articles that I assigned in my class. So instead of writing papers in a class that I taught last winter, um, so last January or so, um, uh, I had my students improve Wikipedia articles. And uh, the purple shows the sort of the initial quality state is estimate, estimated completeness in terms of those articles at the beginning of the class and the green shows them at the end. And so you can see that my students did great work and improved a whole bunch of articles from, I don't know, about what it looks like between zero and 30% complete, uh, maybe a little bit more um, to, to quite a lot higher. Um, uh, you can see that you can see that, that, that density shifting pretty heavily to the right. It can also be used for making specific suggestions for article improvement by interrogating the model. It can be used, of course, for research, and you will see plenty of examples of that. There's lots to love about ORAs. I can talk about ORAs for days. Um, uh, there are hundreds of models, dozens of languages. Um, it's been developed in this really, really cool participatory um, process. You should see Estelle Smith's article. Um, she's an article at CHI 2020 on the process through which it's built um, that really folds it out as a model for other kinds of um, other kinds of sort of like uh, AI model development, and I think it's really, really a compelling argument. Um, and it has a bunch of features that allow sort of like uh, support model inspection and what it calls sort of dependency injection or feature injection, which allows you to essentially kind of uh, ask the model to, to test certain kinds of counterfactuals. So if these features had been different, how would the um, uh, how would the, the particular scores be different? And, and I'll walk through an example of something that does that. So that's ours, um, uh, in a nutshell. Um, uh, and I want to switch to some of the work that um, that my group has done, and in particular, I want to um, uh, begin to answer uh, to return to that 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 question. So I've sort of like uh, that that I sort of uh, sort of ended the the, the first chunk of this talk with about this tension between the 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 sort of participation, sort of encouraging more participation um, from lots of folks like new and unregistered users, and the fact that these people are the source of a lot of bad stuff. And I really explored this dynamic um, uh, um, uh, in a paper uh, called, uh, the title is Effective Algorithmic uh, uh, Flagging on Fairness, Flagging Turned 11 from Wikipedia. And this was a paper that was really led by um, Nate Tablentheis um, and was published uh, in, uh, I guess, uh, a little more than a year ago um, in, uh, in Computer Supported Cooperative Work. It was actually started as an internship project that Nate did when he joined the, um, the ORS team at the Wikimedia Foundation uh, as, a, as a research intern. Um, and he put just a ton and ton of effort into this project. So um, uh, when, he, when he sort of came back from university, I sort of joined the project project and work with on it. So I'm um, happy to talk about it, but I think that uh, uh, Nate deserves a lot of credit for this and I want to point you to him and his, his work. Okay, so um, I want to walk through an example of what, uh, of the, uh, I'm going to give you a concrete example of how uh, the ORS works um, in terms of in terms of damaging uh, in terms of this this, um, this edit scoring because this paper is looking at this idea of sort of um, uh, bias as it regards to edit scoring and I've already sort of, I've already hinted at the, the 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 setup for this but before you do that I want to show you an example so this is that this is the edit I tracked down the edit that introduced that term Velociraptor into the Jeremy Renner article in English Wikipedia and you can see that it was um, uh, and and I and I asked ORS to tell me whether or not it thinks it's uh, it's damaging if tell me not it, it thinks it was made in good faith and ORS thinks that it was probably damaging uh, um, and that it was uh, probably not made in good faith. Uh, it, it gives a probability for this so it gives sort of like a you know it, it, it tells me whether or not the uh, um, uh, what its prediction is sort of in absolute terms and then it gives me the probability. Um, I would interpret this as saying that there is a one third chance that Jeremy Renner is actually a velociraptor, um, although I think that's probably not the correct way to interpret this. Um, but you can see that there's some uncertainty about the the, the idea that this was a damaging edit. Um, um, uh, some people are velociraptors, uh, and you can see that it's a little bit less sure um, about whether or not it was made in good faith or not. It's um, you know, almost almost even odds. Um, uh, Look at the same article in Batman uh, on the on the Batman article, the one that replaced the entire text of the article with on and on and on and on Batman. Uh, or is a little bit less ambivalent about this. Um, it thinks that uh, it also thinks that it's damaging, um, which it is, uh, and it places the probability higher, at closer to 
closer to 0.8. Um, uh, um, it is uh, similarly sure that uh, the articles are not made in good faith. Um, there is differences between the damaging and good faith models. They're pretty strongly correlated in my experience um, in the data that we've looked at, um, uh, but uh, they do potentially, um, they, you know, they, 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 that a lot of a lot of damaging or vandalism articles are made in bad faith, but they are they are different models that can, in some corner cases, lead to different results. Okay. So I already showed you that range of tools that are using these things. Um, these, and so what they're doing is that and all these tools are basically just looking at edits like these. Um, they're, taking, they're, they're taking this in and then they're acting, right? They're either going to revert articles because the probability is very high that it's damaging, or they're going to uh, flag an article and put it in front of a person using an, an, a system like uh, Huggle or something, which is going to um, uh, allow that person to press a button and do the same thing. Now, um, uh, I think that one uh, that, that in this way, the tools like ours, not just ours, but um, uh, these editing uh, um, uh, uh, scoring models have massively increased the efficiency of the anti-vandalism work. One person can do the work, can do work with a tool like Huggle, or certainly with running a bot that's just you know working in a headless way of just huge and huge amounts of time. Um, uh, I think that in the in the Ours paper, um, uh, Hafner and Geiger sort of walk through this. They suggest that it would take like. 430 some hours a day to just, uh, if people are doing sort of, I think it was 10 edits a minute, um, uh, just to review all the edits that are being made for vandalism. And by, by allowing people to focus their energy in the stuff that is likely vandalism, it can really increase the efficiency. Um, but this increase in efficiency comes at a cost, right? And I've already sort of walked through that cost. Um, the first uh, was very clear, right? Having your work undone by bots appears to coincide with decreases in retention. And there's some evidence um, initially from this paper by um, uh, um, that I've already mentioned by Hafiger et al. Um, but but lots of evidence more recently that uh, that that suggests that this is that this is real. That having your work undone by a system is really dispiriting. Um, uh, people go away. And there are other reasons. It's not just dispiriting. Sometimes people actually try to like ask, they like try to talk to the person that like undid their work, which is hard if you're talking to a bot, maybe decreasingly hard as chat systems get better, but um, uh, but but the bots don't answer. So that's the first reason, right? And I've already talked about that. The second reason is, is that while systems like ORS are good, they're not perfect. Um, uh, and so this is just some ROC curves, which if you've looked at models you might uh, like machine learning models you'll like be familiar with and if you haven't don't worry about it what the, the um what this is showing is essentially the performance of the model um uh, uh or is uh using a set of um a hand coded data set that um that we built uh um uh, on uh for, for for a paper i'll show you later um for for four different classes of editors um so for example ip editors is in the top right corner and registered editors is right below it um and what you see is that like what is always the case is that like yeah, the model makes for, for any particular threshold, there's some false positive rate, which is, you know, real. Um, uh, there are real false positives that are being made by these systems. They're not perfect. Um, and they're and they're and they're often are likely less perfect than people. But also what you see here, they're actually differently imperfect, imperfect across classes of people, which actually brings me to the, and it actually sort of is the final point, which is that ORS is particularly biased against new and unregistered users. Um, uh, the problem, of course, is that, uh, and so this graph actually just shows the probability that uh, that ORS thinks that a model, uh, that an edit is damaging, um, uh, minus the probability that it that it was damaging based on the sort of the hand-coded sample. And this is actually, uh, all of these are different points for different language Wikipedia editions um, that have deployed ORS. And this is from uh, Nate Blondheis's uh, paper, the one I'm actually talking about. <laughs> um, I don't know if this actually showed up in the paper, but this was something we built, he built as part of the process. Um, uh, the problem, of course, and, and what you see is that, like, actually, that, that um, well, I'm two things. One is, is that, like, ORS is pretty, it's across the board that um, most of these numbers are all above zero. ORS is, generally speaking, like, pretty skeptical of the edits are being, which are made, but it's much more skeptical of edits being made by unregistered users relative to how bad they are. Um, that that uh, I, ORS is really biased against folks without accounts. Now, the reason is not hard to put together. Unregistered users really are quite bad. Um, uh, literally every piece of vandalism I've shown you so far has been made by an unregistered user. And so the model has learned that unregistered users are, this, are, 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 are a source of bad stuff. Um, 
Well, it's un but that doesn't necessarily mean that the introduction of horrors will lead to bad outcomes for unregistered users because, um, uh, because Wikipedia editors are also pretty biased against unregistered editors, right? In the absence of, of, of a system like, uh, like horrors or an ML tool to do this, um, what people end up doing is they look through recent changes and they look at all the edits which are made by those IP addresses, the ones that are made by users that accounts, and they pay particular uh, attention to that. In that sense, unre unregistered users are one class of users on Wikipedia that is what um, people consider overprofiled, right? They get more attention um, uh, than they really deserve. And in this sense, it's actually not clear what the introduction of a system like ours will do. It could compound things um, and make it worse for those unregistered because it's biased, right? Or it could be less biased than whatever it is that people are doing in the absence of the system in ways that actually lead to better outcomes for, for users. And this is sort of the question that the, that the, that the, that the paper that Nate led is trying to unpack. Now, um, we did this by looking at the deployment of ORS within a bunch of systems. Now, as I've suggested, ORS is just an API, right? It's just a like a like a like a web service. Um, there's no interface to it. And so, um, talking about the deployment of ORS is a little bit funny. It's like it's just sort of like stood up somewhere. Did anyone pay attention to it? Um, uh, what we instead did um, uh, in this paper was look at the deployment of an uh, interface to ORS called RC filters, and it's like recent changes filters. Um, uh, and there's a lot to unpack. This is a picture of it, and there's a lot to unpack. So I'll sort of walk through. It. Um, this is um, this is very similar to that sort of history uh, that I that I looked at before. You've got um, these links that say dip and hiss, and those are just hyperlinks that take you to a list so you can see the actual difference which is being made or the broader history. Um, uh, after the two periods is the name of the articles which were being edited. So, for example, the Valletta Floriana rivalry is one of the articles. Um, Billy Chow is another one. Um, uh, um, you see a timestamp, you see this plus or minus, which just guess how much stuff was changed. And then after that, you see the user who made the change. All right. In addition to all, that's all normal. That's all been there from, 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 from forever. What RC filters does is it annotates that. And it annotates it by adding the color, those nice yellow bits, um, uh, and uh, um, yellow and red, um, uh, and those dots. Um, and those dots suggest whether or not uh, th th those, those particular changes, those edits, are above uh, a set of thresholds. And those thresholds correspond to arbitrary thresholds that are called uh, maybe damaging, likely damaging, and very likely damaging. And they are arbitrary thresholds. And there's, they're, they're chosen through a principled way, but they are necessarily arbitrary. Um, um, the interface also shows um, uh, whether or not uh, edits are made by unregistered editors, and that's important as well, because people can see that as well. Now, the fact that these thresholds are arbitrary um, uh, sets us up to be able to actually look for causal evidence of the introduction of this system. Because those, um, because the, 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 um, the, the edits that are made that are scored at just below the threshold and the edits that are scored just below the threshold are like, incredibly similar in terms of their likelihood to be damaging. Like out in the you know fifth or sixth uh, decimal point, right? They're really the same, but because one is above some arbitrary threshold and the other one is below the arbitrary threshold, one of them is flagged and the other one isn't. One of them is flagged with two dots and the other one is flagged with only one. So I want to draw um, uh, um, uh, what I can, what this lets us do is use a system called a, a, a method that's used a lot in a lot of social science for I um, call the regression discontinuity design, which basically fits a linear regression uh, in the way that you would sort of think, or actually really two linear regressions uh, in the normal way, but then looks for uh, what you think of as a bump at that threshold, um, potentially a change in the slope as well. And if we find either, we'll know the only reason that there's a bump there, the only reason that there's that jump is because it was caused by that threshold. Right, so we'll know that it's for it. So, does RC filters make a difference in terms of the likelihood that something is reverted? Oh yes, oh yes, it does. Um, uh, this is the um, uh, you can see that uh, this, these are, these are sort of model predictive probabilities um, across uh, all the uh, you know, forget what you can the numbers, but a dozen, a couple dozen or so uh, wikis that sort of um, roll this out, and you can see that the probability of something being reverted from right below and right above the threshold is massively different. Like. 30%. Um, this is, uh, it doesn't actually make a very difference at the highest threshold, um, but that's likely because that stuff is being actually already reverted by other bots, some of which are using ORs or other models. Um, but at the lower levels, the likely damaging and the maybe damaging, it makes a big difference. It drives a lot of uh, um, work. Now, does it affect that bias against unregistered users? The answer again is yes. So on the left side, you have the, um, the, the, you have the effect on unregistered users. And on the right side, you have the effect on registered users. 
um, uh, and, the, and, and the effect is higher um, uh, for registered users than it is on unregistered users. You can actually think of this as increasing what's called sort of like in AI fairness, like demographic parity. In other words, like who you are doesn't affect how you're treated. And ORS moves us towards um, the introduction of RC filters um, actually increases demographic fairness. Um, uh, um, it also actually reduces unfair sanctioning or what you might think of as like sort of unfair, uh, um, uh, unfair reverting. And so um, in Wikipedia, someone can come and revert your edit, but someone else can come along and they can revert your revert, right? Um, and so this is what, what I sort of call a, um, we call this a controversial, a controversial sanction. Um, and what you see is that at the, at the, at the very likely damaging and the likely damaging threshold, but really you see the point estimates at all three levels. Um, you see that there is an increase in the, um, sorry, there's a, there's a decrease in the amount of unfair sanctioning. That the introduction of this system causes people to be less likely to revert users without, um, uh, um, less likely to, uh, to, to revert people in ways that are sort of undone later. Um, the, 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 the change is by a factor of zero, the odds that are 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 times as much. It's a small, but it's a meaningful and a statistically significant difference. Um, this work has been followed up, um, uh, it's been, I think it's, it's, it's a really cool method. I think Nate deserves a ton of credit for this. Um, uh, it's been followed up by a bunch of people. This is a, I'll just give a quick shout out to this paper by um, uh, Leiji Wong and Haiyi Zhu at Carnegie Mellon who reproduced this study really just like, like almost exactly. Um, but they did, uh, but they, they, they had some slightly different results. And I think that they, they centered our work in one important way. Our work was really focused on um, showing sort of coverage effects of these systems um, across these different, um, these, these different wikis. What they did was they showed that the effect of the system was actually different depending on the size of the community, that the introduction of a tool like RC, RC filters or a tool like or ORs will actually shape the nature of work being done very uh, differently in small communities than it does in big ones. I think that's the big sort of punchline. Okay. Now, another punchline from the previous study is that, um, uh, is that there are very likely things we can do to make things better or at least more fair for these newcomers and yet unregistered users. And that's great news. But I think that before we do, we should identify whether or not we should. And answering this question requires some knowledge of the value of contributions from these sort of unregistered users. And I think that figuring out the, the ones who aren't contributing um, and figuring out the value of something that isn't happening is always a huge challenge. Um, and so I've done a bunch of work on this in the context of um, a range of peer production projects, um, including Wikipedia and other wikis. Um, a lot of it is actually very quasi-experimental, so it doesn't involve, um, doesn't involve machine learning. Um, I'm going to show you one piece right now, or part of one piece, that, um, that uses uh, uh, an order's uh, good faith model in a way that informs policy, which I think shows you how these work can be integrated into sort of what I would consider sort of policy relevant uh, social science. Um, this is a piece, the title of the piece is called Are Anonymity Seekers Just Like Everybody Else? Um, an analysis of contributions to Wikipedia from Tor, and the work was led by Chow Tran and Kaylee Champion. Uh, Chow is at um, NYU, Kaylee is at, uh, at the University of Washington. I'll introduce, uh, I'll talk to them. Uh, you'll see her again soon. And what this piece does is it uh, looks at users of the Tor system. Tor sort of sometimes it stands for, I don't know if it, I think this may be one of these acronyms that has also been defined away, but originally the onion router and um, uh, it is, uh, and this is sort of a visualization of sort of roughly how it works. The basic idea is it's, it's an anonymity proxy. So users who want to say anonymous um, uh, can use it. And what they do is instead of making, you know, like a request from their computer to the server. So for example, like by making from my web browser to Wikipedia, I would instead uh, make a request to, uh, I would run Tor and I would make a request via Tor. And what the Tor program would do is it would identify a whole bunch of different computers that are participating in the Tor network. And it would build me a path with three of them. And so what I would do is I would encrypt with a lot of cryptography um, uh, in an address sort of, I would encrypt and encrypt and encrypt my request and I would hand it off to um, one server and all that server would be able to see is where the next step is and then they would hand it off to the next step and then they would be able to decrypt the outer layer and they would see who the next step is and they would be able to decrypt that layer and they would be able to see where it's going. But the person who's making the request, that exit relay, um, is not going to know who made the request. All they know is who the middle relay was. Everybody only knows one uh, hop away from themselves. And as a result, um, uh, the users can uh, visit websites, for example, like Wikipedia, and Wikipedia will never know who it is that's visiting. They will just know that someone from Tor is. And similarly, the um, 
the, uh, the, the, the Wikipedia has no idea. They'll know that an edit's coming from Tor, but they won't know who the, um, who, who the user is. Um, so it's sort of anonymous on both sides. Um, now, the problem is, is that people who are anonymity seeking, um, like other new and unregistered users, are often the source of bad stuff. And so um, uh, because people have used Tor to do bad things in the past, um, Tor has been blocked from Wikipedia for, gosh, probably close to 20 years. Um, uh, and if you try to edit Tor on Wikipedia, you'll see a page that looks like this. This is English Wikipedia, and it says you are currently unable to edit Wikipedia. Um, uh, because the uh, IP address you are using is known to be part of an open or anonymizing proxy, which is, of course, true. Wikipedia just blocks Tor. But Wikipedia has not always been that great at blocking Tor. This is actually a list of, this is a, a histogram of the number of edits made to Wikipedia via Tor. Should be zero, right? Um, but it's not. Um, and it's not for a few reasons. Um, one is, is that uh, new, uh, if we go back to that, the graph here, new exit relays are joining the network and it takes a little, um, and they publish, there's a list of all the exit relays, but it takes a little bit of time for Wikipedia to find out that an exit relay has been added. And there's an opportunity for anyone who gets randomly sorted into that exit relay to to, um, to, to make an edit to Wikipedia. Um, but also sometimes the Wikipedia system, which blocks Tor, has just not worked super well. Um, and it's been replaced and reworked at several points over time. And you can see that in spikes in this graph. And so some people just, I don't know, didn't get the memo that they weren't allowed to edit Wikipedia via Tor. And as a result, we're, uh, well, not as a result. Um, and, and also um, we're able to edit Wikipedia via Tor. Um, and so what this study wanted to do was to compare these, these, uh, these, these contributions from Wikipedians uh, and the, the likelihood of, for example, whether they were damaging or good faith um, uh, from, these, from these Tor users to other kinds of users as a way of helping inform conversations about whether and how these, these things should be blocked in the future. Um, we can use them as a, as, a, as a measure of at least some portion of the kinds of things that would be happening if Tor were not blocked, because we know what we have some sense of what proportion of edits uh, of, of Tor users, uh, how many Tor users there are, what portion of them are like able to sneak through, and we can get some sense of how much value is being lost. So um, to do that, we built sort of four comparative sets. And sets. The first are people that are editing for the first time. The second are these Tor editors I've already talked about. The third are these unregistered editors called IP editors, right, because they're listed with their IP address. And the fourth are registered users. Um, um, and what we want to do is we can take these, these random set of edits from each of these groups and we can hand them to to orcs, for example, we can ask it to tell me whether or not these things were made in good faith. Um, now, the problem, of course, is that as we've already established, ORS is pretty biased against, for example, it won't know whether an editor is Tor based, but it sure will know whether they have an account. It's pretty biased against that. And so we can use this dependency injection feature here to generate a set of predictions as if they were made by, for example, um, a, a set of editors. So essentially what we do is we, 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 we give a list of revisions to, or, to ORS, but we essentially, lie to it or we uh, about the other features of the article. So we essentially hold a set of other features constant and we're able to generate a set of predictions which are like sort of counterfactual predictions. What would the score for this article have been if, if all of these edits had been made by a person with the same amount of experience and the same sort of like um, sort of editing uh, like uh, sort of um, abilities. And what we see is that they look pretty similar. Um, the registered editors are, are, are absolutely substantially higher in terms of the quality of their edits than the vast majority of, um, than, uh, of other editors. That's the group on the right. And this is, a, this is using the good faith, good, good faith model. Um, so we see that sure enough, yeah, like the, 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 the vast majority of, these, of, of, of those um, edits by registered editors um, uh, are, are, are seen as good faith. And it's higher than any of those other three groups. But that among those other three groups, Tor editors don't look substantially different than other you know, first time, as you look maybe a little bit better than those first time, first time editors and pretty similar to most IP editors. Um, and then again, this is just one small part of the analysis. Um, we found that anonymous users or Tor users were, um, uh, were similar uh, to, other, to other new editors in many other ways. Um, but hopefully this illustrates some of the power and uh, basic power of this approach. Um, so the final study. So um, now, uh, when we talked about, uh, this is about using sort of like, uh, um, this is a final study which can unpack how we can use article quality scoring to understand uh, quality dynamics over time. Now, um, when I talked about protection earlier, um, uh, you know, the Jeremy Rutter article being um, protected, um, I've written a paper about protection, uh, page protection. Um, one thing you might realize is that, uh, that page protection is not equally distributed across topics. Jeremy Renner is protected and most articles aren't. It's kind of funny, the vast majority of 
um, uh, of, of articles on Wikipedia are not protected. You can go and edit them. But a really disproportionately large number of views are to articles that are protected because the kinds of things that are really popular tend to be the kinds of things that are protected. Um, uh, the kinds of things that are vandalized a lot tend to be the kinds of things that are protected. The kinds of things that are popular tend to be vandalized. But there's other things that are sort of systematic patterns to, 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 to protection, to the locking down of articles. Um, and one of them relates to topics. Things that are about sex are very, very often protected. Things that are about politics, um, things that are well taboo. And so this study that we did on, um, on, uh, uh, on, on sort of anonymity, uh, anonymous users, one thing we saw was a lot of contributions in these spaces to articles that we would consider kind of taboo topics, right? Like someone wants to improve the article on pedophilia, but do I really want to do that with my account? Do I maybe want to be anonymous and use an anonymous uh, uh, anonymity proxy, proxy when I do that? Um, do I want that to be in my permanent record? Now, um, uh, in large part because they're cited anonymous users, Kaylee Champion from the last project um, set up this new study. And this is actually a paper which is still under review. It's not published yet. The title is Taboo and Collaborative Knowledge Production Evidence from Wikipedia. Happy to share a copy. And I just, um, uh, you can reach out to Kaylee or I to talk about this. Um, I'm sharing it because I'm really excited about it because I think that it shows a third way that uh, these machine learning systems can help inform policy decisions within communities. And the goal of this paper was really just to compare activity um, uh, and, uh, and sort of like dynamics in, around quality, but around a set of other things too, on taboo topics to non-taboo topics. Now, um, uh, and we used ORS to do that. Now, the first challenge actually was building a, um, was building a, a, like a, a list of taboo topics. Um, identifying a set of things within Wikipedia that were taboo. Um, this is actually, and so there's actually a different little um, classifier that was built here. Kaylee had a brilliant uh, sort of observation that people tend to use euphemism when they talk about taboo. So we don't say, we don't say um, the person died, we say they passed away. Um, uh, we create euphemism as a way of distancing ourselves from things that we want to say. And so what she realized was is that English wiki, the wiki wiktionary, and actually she saw it first in Italian wiktionary, but it exists in a bunch of other languages as well, that certain um, uh, certain definitions are actually tagged. So for example, up here on the slide, you can see the you can see the word member, which is a bunch of different definitions, including a part of a whole or a part of an animal. And euphemistically, it could mean the penis. And I'm even saying this in like an academic talk makes me feel like a violating a little bit of a taboo, um, uh, um, which I think is a sign that her approach is working. Um, and so what she did was she built a classifier that used not the term, so not the word member, but all the definitions here. And that essentially used the words, so the, the, the engrams, so like the, the, the terms in all of these definitions um, uh, to, to, to identify whether a definition is likely to be euphemistic or not. Um, and so uh, the kinds of words that are in the euphemistic definitions would be things that are likely to be taboo. She actually, um, there's a quick, um, I'll, I'll move through this really quickly, but basically she, she, she took the dictionary definition, built this classifier, used the, um, the took all the, the, the engrams, which were um, predictive in the model, took a random subset of those to create a, a a random set of articles, took the ones that were strongly associated with euphemistic definitions and used that to generate a set of taboo articles. Um, and what we found uh, was, uh, was a few things. One was is that these articles were in fact protected at a higher rate. Um, and they were in fact edited um, as predicted by more uh, um, by users who are likely to be unregistered, right? So we're seeing sort of basically what we expect. And sure enough, we see more damaging contributions coming into those as well, um, which makes sense. Um, uh, the taboo articles have a higher proportion um, of, of bad stuff, stuff that is sort of undone. Um, uh, um, so again, we sort of expect, but I think that um, uh, we were able, in this study, we were able to go, go past just looking at the edits that were coming in to actually understand how this was affecting these overall quality dynamics. And what we found was actually really interesting. Um, um, in order to do that, we need to first unpack a little bit how quality is measured in Wikipedia and how it's measured in ORS. So um, this varies from different language Wikipedias, but in English Wikipedia, um, articles are sorted into a set of classes and people look at articles and they decide whether or not what class they're in there. So at the very top are FA, which stands for featured articles, FL is a featured list. Um, uh, good articles are right above, are right below that. Those are, um, and there are tens of thousands of those. Um, uh, and then at the very bottom are things like stops and starts of which there are literally millions and you've seen them. They're just the articles that are, um, you know, a couple sentences, so on and so forth. Um, and what ORS does is it takes this data, it takes the version of the, the articles when they were classified by a person in these categories, and it uses a set of structural features, things like 
citations or length or the number of images, that kind of stuff, to make a guess um, as to what uh, likelihood it thinks that it's going to be in any number of these categories. So, for example, if we look, if we ask for us to estimate the quality of the University of Washington article, it will say, oh, it's a pretty good article. Uh, it'll say that there's a 41, uh, the probability that it's in a featured article is 0.41, the probability that it's a good article is 0.44, and it's almost certainly not a stub or a start. Um, good article. Um, uh, pe what people do with these things afterwards is kind of complicated. Nate, Nate Tablon has, has a really nice paper, uh, which uh, um, looks at uh, how you can integrate these things together into like a, a, a one-dimensional um, measure of quality um, without just assuming that these things are equally spaced. Um, it's great work. He published it in OpenSim a couple years ago. I recommend you take a look. Um, uh, but I'll show you one more example. This is the Austrian Research Institute for Artificial Intelligence. And as you can see, it's not a great article. Sorry, uh, I'm not, uh, it's, uh, um, it's, not, it's not bad, it's just kind of a start. Um, uh, and you can look at the article, this is the whole article from the screen right here, it makes sense, right? It's, it's, it has very few, it has two citations, uh, it has some red links, uh, it has a lot of stuff missing, lots of, lots of work that can be done. Now, what Kaylee did was she took those scores, um, she took these scores for every single revision of every single article. And this is something which is really hard to do with the sample. It's actually something that you can't really do. Uh, uh, it's really hard to imagine doing it in the absence of something like a system like ours, but we can actually track, it's, uh, uh, we can actually then use it to piece together estimates of the growth of these things over time. And what we see is super interesting. What we found was that taboo articles are, since the moment of creation, generally speaking, higher quality than the non-taboo articles. Um, uh, and the reasons we, we can't nail completely here, but they seem to be pretty interesting. So one is, one explanation is that uh, the standards are higher um, for taboo articles because they're under more scrutiny from more people. Um, there tends to be more attention paid to them. The second article is, is, that, is that it may be because they're subject to increased amounts of vandalism. Vandalism tends to, in work that um, Andrea Grabati has done, uh, uh, has, has shown that it can, and, and I, I've done some work with Aaron Shaw, which has shown this in Wikia as well, um, that, 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 uh, that these new and unregistered users, even if they're vandals, they tend to attract the attention of more established users who then drive productive. While they're there, they clean up the mess and then they fix other stuff as well. Um, and so, um, and what we find is that systematically, I mean, the gap narrows over time, but that systematically, these articles are generally speaking higher quality. Um, and in a similar way, this is showing um, article creation date. Uh, this uh, provides a little bit of evidence that, that maybe the, the standards have changed over time. So what we see is that, um, that until about 2010, um, articles that were being created, whether they were taboo or not, were sort of like of kind of equal and reasonably low quality at the point in which they're created. Um, uh, and that in general, the quality of new articles has gone up. The standards for what constitutes a new article that can stick in English Wikipedia has gone up over time. Um, uh, but I think that that's the... the um, uh, the, 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 but the, but the, the, the taboo articles sort of, um, have moved moved um, uh, high, into higher standards um, moving forward. All right, I have a few con concluding thoughts. Um, the the first is just that the peer production projects like Wikipedia they face they face a complex problem. There's this tension between maintaining quality and allowing for open participation. Um, uh, from groups like unregistered contributions and machine learning tools and automatic bots are part of the problem, but um, uh, are part of the problem in that they turn up the kind of quality and damage control side of the equation in ways that sort of cause collateral damage. And often that damage is hard to see in kind of A-B tests, but it's ultimately revealed in things like smaller cohorts of people who sort of hold them off and clean things up in the future. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, in the future in, in, in which we sort of, uh, and through by building reliance on these tools. But I hopefully have also suggested that, um, that that these tools can be can be useful and they can be part of the solution. So in the first study, I tried to show how um, these AI powered tools, even ones that are demonstrably biased, can in some ways lead to less bias in the broader socio-technical system. And in the second study on Tor, in the third one on uh, taboo topics, I showed how these models can help uh, uh, provide information to reveal hidden value and dynamics that can inform policy decisions about when and how to open up. Um, as a final word, um, as you know, and as sort of said at the very beginning, I'm a consumer of these methods, right? I'm a social scientist. Um, but I think, so I, and so I hope that in the process of making this argument and sort of showing you some of the work that my group has done, um, I hope I've made the case for, um, for, for social science, um, both about 
uh, AI systems and using them. Um, and this is the thing that I'm very excited about um, and I appreciate you all taking the time to hear me um, and hear about some of our group's work. So I have some thanks up here and I'm happy to just leave this for a second and uh, um, thank everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. So 